Hi, my name is Lane and I have a story to share. The intent behind sharing this story is to develop greater understanding and appreciation for the factors that affect our judgment. The vehicle for communicating the significance of this comes from a story, my own story, of a perilous situation I found myself in last month. The situation involves power lines. Now before we dive into the story, I think it's important that we approach it with the right attitude. And what I mean by that is we refrain from hindsight bias. It's just too easy to take an incident and, and you know, work back one step and, and, and uh, conclude that was a dumb decision. You shouldn't have done that and you could have avoided the whole situation altogether. But doing things like that deprive us of the opportunity of learning how someone arrived at that decision point in the first place. That's what we want to learn. How does someone get to a point where they make a decision that they think is viable, that they think is a decent choice, but it results in disaster or near disaster? I think it's also worth mentioning that with any aviation mishap, it's never just one thing that goes wrong. It's a series of events or variables. Um, when I was a wildland firefighter, we would call it the Swiss cheese model. Think of multiple slices of Swiss cheese. Each one of those holes represents um, a detrimental circumstance of some kind. Uh, and it's when multiple holes line up that disaster can make its way through. <sighs> yeah, and then some of the worst can happen. Let's dive into the story. So it was mid-August and the forecast looked phenomenal. The top of the lift was between 12 and 14,000 feet. There was a fair amount of humidity, so you could actually see these beautiful little cumulus clouds. It was a full-on checkerboard sky. It had cross-country potential written all over it. I was so stoked. It was a Monday, and, and I do a 36-hour fast every week. I've been doing it for probably oh, close to two years now. That just so happened to coincide with this beautiful cross-country day. So when I was out there flying, I hadn't had food for quite a while. I was flying with two other pilots. We got to launch around noon, and I laid out my wing, built a wall, brought it up, nice smooth inflation at about 12.30. And, you know, within 15 minutes, I was up at cloud base. And it was time to send it and go north northeast, all the way up to this little community known as Smith's Ferry. Oh, and I should mention, we launched from a place called Squaw Butte, just north of this little town called Emmett, Idaho. Honestly, this flight was amazing. I mean, it was, it was active, just like any cross-country flight usually is, you know, if you're really going to get into some strong thermals. So, you know, it can, it can be a little taxing, but, you know, the euphoria was just... I, you know, I was in my happy place. And being up there, cloud base, it was just magical. Getting on bar, boom, sending it out to the next cumulus cloud and then circling up with a hawk. So at this point, I'd gone definitely, you know, over 24 hours without any food, which is the norm. I do that all the time. But what's different is I'm involved in something that's both physically and mentally taxing. Like, you know, keeping that wing overhead with an aspect ratio of 6.98 involves some really active piloting. And I didn't really account for how much that wore me down. And I think the reason I didn't account for that is I was just so euphoric. Like, being up there at cloud base and covering some real ground, it was really, truly one of the best flights of my life until it wasn't. So the first portion of my triangle was about 45 kilometers towards Smith's Ferry. Boom, tagged that, and then I started making my way to the, would have been to the west. You know, I got as far as I could there, and then, you know, it's about five o'clock at this point, and the thermals are starting to get weak. And before I know it, I'm like 2,000 feet AGL, above ground level. And it's starting to look like I'm not going to complete this triangle. I'm not going to make it back to my truck. Fortunately, we have, uh, we have someone that volunteered to uh, run chase and be our driver for the day. So I look out in the distance in this valley and I see a road. And I'm thinking, well, okay, that'd be optimal logistically to land by a road. 
and I could just use my inReach and send my coordinates. So it's after five o'clock, I got the road in sight, and I'd say I'm definitely less than a mile away from this road. And I'm headed in there, headed that way, and I'm headed west, so into the sunset, so boom, light, you know, sun in my eyes. And while, while I was on that path, I noticed these super tall structures. And it was apparent, whoa, those structures, those are power lines. And those aren't your little neighborhood power lines. These are the real deals. Um, they go from a hydroelectric facility to, uh, you know, mu municipality to the north. And they're about 120 feet high, and they're transferring 230,000 volts. Okay? Whoa. And I'm starting to get to about 1,500 feet above ground level. And I'm about a mile away, but I'm pen penetrating a, a bit of a stiff headwind. So I'm not covering a whole lot of ground all that quickly. And on top of that, I quickly find myself in massive sink. Like we're talking 6.5 to 7.2 meters a second down. So I am losing altitude fast. And I'm still heading toward that road. And I'm thinking, oh, well, a bit of a bummer. I'm not going to make it all the way back to my truck. But it's been a hell of a day. You know, I've covered so much ground. It's been so sublime being up so high you know I spent most of the flight between 10 and 12,000 feet that's another factor worth keeping in mind you know I live at about 3,000 feet so I am really spending time at altitude and my caloric intake is non-existent I had a cereal bar you know I always fly with emergency rations to survive for 36 hours if need be um, but I didn't bother eating it because you know I like to stay committed to my fast remember I had this like window it was like a, a half second window where it dawned on me like whoa I don't have a whole lot of altitude and I am cutting it close with those power lines should I turn away or keep going turn away keep going turn away keep going I could not make a decision so I just defaulted to continuing on that path and and I got to the point where it's like, well, I'm committed now. I can't be making sharp turns. That'll definitely cause a loss of altitude. So I remember watching the power lines go underneath my harness by 10 to 12 feet. Super, super close. Closer than I'm ever comfortably admitting. But, you know, I want to because I want this story to get out. Because I think it's important. I think we can learn from, from this. And then, you know, I just had to stay with it. And I knew it. I knew, boy, I looked down at those power lines we're cutting it close and I remember flying over them and, and watching them go under my harness by about 10 to 12 feet Whoa, crazy close but then I got onto the other side and I thought oh that was close but okay here's the road I'm about to set up for my landing and while all that's happening suddenly my glider just yanks me backward and that power line I thought I had just cleared by 10 to 12 feet, suddenly I drop below it, it hits me in the back of the head, and I fall underneath of it, and then boom, it slams right into my abdomen. And it starts arcing. Bzz, 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 like blue and white light. Crazy, crazy amount of pain. I, I thought I knew what real pain was, I thought I knew what a 10 was on that scale. <sighs> nothing nothing no, everything pales in comparison to the pain of electrocution it was so painful i couldn't even really form a thought i'm thinking this might be it this might be how i go and i just felt stupid ashamed embarrassed all the while dealing with unprecedented pain while I'm going through this experience, I, I have this visceral recollection of just, just the impact 
death has on the people we care about. One of my best friends went in about a month prior to this incident. And I did CPR on him until the flight nurse pulled me off and told me to stop and they put a sheet over his body. That sucked. But having witnessed firsthand the pain, the agony, the frustration that that my friend's family and loved ones went through, I felt like there's no way. I can't. I can't die. I have to survive. There's no way the flying community could handle another fatality. And that's when I pressed up as high as I could on my tippy toe to raise my chest a little higher because I know as an EMT, you know, with electricity like that, of that scale, 230,000 volts, you know, if that stuff gets too close to the heart, it could throw off the rhythm and result in like V-fib, you know? So I, I pressed up really high, which is why I have this entry and exit wound um, in my abdomen. The pain is just so horrific. The only thing I can think of is I have to make it stop. How can I make this pain stop? And I remember pulling out my hook knife and thinking, well, if I'm gonna die by electrocution, I'm about a hundred feet in the air. <sighs> Let's just, let's just accelerate this process and arrive at my demise with a traumatic impact. So I pull out my hook knife and I start cutting my risers to just free fall. And I remember my left riser, I got through about a third of it. And, and in the process, I managed to wiggle myself into a position where the least amount of metal was touching me. And suddenly the pain went from 10 plus down to eight. And I could actually form a thought. My first thought was, what the hell am I doing? Immediately ditched my hook knife and thought, whoa, okay, this situation sucks. What resources do I have? How can I, how can I fix this? How can I survive? And, you know, I, I've been carrying this thing for years and years and years. Never needed it like this. My Garmin inReach. I get to that. And it takes two hands to get to it. And remember, the pain finally decreased. The last thing I want to do is move. But to get to my inReach, you know, it's in my left hip pocket. And it's going to take two hands. And I'm so glad my inReach was there because in between my carabiners, everything on my flight deck, my variometer and my phone, completely fried by the electricity. But my inReach was elsewhere, fortunately. So I get to my inReach. And I hit that SOS button. And I want to create a timeline for all this. So the time of impact, the time I flew into the power lines, it's fried in my Vario, you know, because my Vario was, was between the carabiners, which were arcing that blue and white light. So my Vario is frozen in time, and on it is permanently stamped 1726. 1726, so about 530. I would say within definitely less than two minutes, probably around 90 seconds, the emergency dispatcher sends me a text message stating something to the effect of, we received your SOS message. Are you indeed in an emergency? Can you please elaborate? And, you know, the, the user interface on these things is straight up out of the 90s. You got to scroll to every letter. And remember, meanwhile, I'm getting electrocuted. So, it takes every bit of tenacity and fortitude I have to type out, yes, hung in power lines. I didn't even bother with spaces. I'm like, you figure it out. Yes, hung in power lines, send. And I continue to get electrocuted. And I'm still thinking, this sucks. You know, maybe I just sent this message so they could find my body. And I feel like I'm in this position that very few people get to to send my last words. You know, I've got a few family members listed in my emergency contacts and and I remember sending a, a message to my to my twin brother just telling him I am so so sorry. And and I love him. I really thought yeah, that might be it for me. But fortunately, who was ever on the other end, that emergency dispatcher through Garmin inReach, 
he or she or whoever took it upon themselves to contact Idaho Power and that constant, bzz, you know, blue and white electricity going in and out of me. And the sound is just, oh, anything that sounds like that is just traumatic for me now. And I'd say within about 15 minutes of sending that message to the emergency dispatcher, explaining that I was in power lines, that constant bzz, through those power lines suddenly just slowly bzz, calmed. And the pain went from, you know, 10 plus down to 8, 7, 4, 3. And I was like, no way. The pain is really, truly decreasing. And that constant buzz and hum gets quiet. I think, no way, no way. Did they just turn off this entire grid? We're talking massive power lines here. I was in disbelief. I couldn't believe it. I was like, really? These power, the power is off? Incrementally, I started to get myself a little more comfortable because I was hung like slightly upside down. My like right hip, my, my right knee was like above my left hip and I was in this awkward angle and you know, I was losing circulation to one of my arms. And, and so I started to wiggle around, get a little more comfortable and I was like, whoa. I'm not, I'm not getting zapped. This is crazy. And everything on me that was metal, everything, yeah, was bzz, bzz. And I've had injuries in the past um, that have resulted in some reconstruction. So I have a fair amount of titanium in me. And that's why the titanium in my uh, right elbow, it burned all the way through all the layers of skin, third degree burns even burned the nerve so it doesn't hurt but I could smell you know smell that burnt flesh and then of course I had the wounds on my abdomen where the electricity was entering and exiting it was arcing between those carabiners and you know using my body as like a surrogate and and with electrical burns you burn from the inside out so what you see superficially pales in comparison to what's going on internally and it goes head to toe so within Within about 15 minutes of the power getting turned off, uh, a local is coming through and, and he, wow, how could you miss uh, a paraglider hung in power lines? So he pulls over and off this dirt road and, and asks if there's anything he can do to help. And he, and he really wants to help. And, you know, really, what can you do? I'm, I'm about 100 feet in the air and we're talking electricity. Uh, but I wanted to give him something to do. And I knew I had emergency services en route, so I asked him to go to the nearest intersection, nearest dirt road intersection, just hang out there and just point resources this way. So altogether, roughly one hour after I activated SOS, we had an ambulance on scene below me. And about an hour and a half after activating the SOS, uh, we had a helicopter show up. And it was a big, beautiful valley, you know, sagebrush. So the helicopter was able to just put it down, no problem. So by the time the helicopter had sat down, we had a whole neighborhood below me and they really couldn't do anything to help. There was about 30 people and I'm sure they were just trying to conjure up every, every, uh, every entertaining every possible idea for somehow helping me out. I mean, what else are you gonna do? You're just, you know, and they don't want to leave. They want to see this thing through. And I'm sure everyone's concerned, even though the power is turned off, you know, what kind of injuries did I sustain during the 15 minutes of solid electrocution? And this was also a really important aspect of this incident. So remember how I said I watched the power lines go 10 to 12 feet under my harness. And, you know, I thought I'm, I'm in the clear, cutting it close as it gets. But, you know, I'm now on the other side of them. And then I got yanked back. So apparently, like probably about three to five feet above my head is what's called the lightning line. And this line is used to ground out lightning, you know, so it doesn't blow up your television or microwave. Um, but this line is super, super thin. And I was flying into the sun. And I also intentionally fly without polarized lenses because I want to be able to see these things. But this line was so thin. I did not see it and my glider got like triple triple wrapped in it and and then you know I go I fall below that power line I thought I had just cleared it hits me in the back of the head clips over me 
and comes onto this side of me and boom, starts zapping me right in the abdomen. And that kind of created this angle that I think allowed for some tension. So it wasn't straight downward tension on that lightning line. I was, I was at an angle and I think that angle may well have been a factor that saved my life. So about two hours into it, we have 30 people on scene, everyone from life flight, local fire trucks, ambulance, two different ambulances, um, my, my three paragliding buddies. Yeah, everyone was there for the show. And I remember, you know, it's about 7.30 now and the sheriff tells me, he says, hey buddy, we got more help on the way for you. We got, we got a truck that's coming out. We're, they're gonna get you down. They're, they're about two hours away. And I remember thinking, oh, really? Another two hours of this? It ended up being a lot more than that. So I flew into the lines roughly 5.30. I didn't get down on the ground. I didn't feel dirt under my feet till about, it, it was close to midnight when I got down on the ground. It was about 11.45. So we're talking close to six and a half hours hanging up there. A lot of time for my mind to wander, a lot of time to beat myself up and just, oh, it was just, oh, it's just so, so embarrassed and ashamed. I mean, really, come on, Lane, how, you, how? I mean, you pride yourself in, in being one of the most conservative pilots as far as you know, safety margins go. How, how does a pilot who writes an article that gets published in the USPA magazine about risk management end up in a set of power lines? How does that happen? So about six and a half hours hanging up there, Idaho Power came up in this uh, like cherry picker of a truck and, and boy was I glad to see those guys. And I stepped into the bucket, this big giant bucket and uh, had a knife on hand and just cut my risers loose. One more or less. Well, just a little bit so you can cut, okay? Okay. You're all right. Let's hook you into this. Bring this back to the basket. Yep. Okay. You got your hook here, bud. You we're gonna, we're gonna cut okay. here. I can kick my legs out here. too. Okay. Can we bring his legs in the basket. There yep. you go. Wow, thank you, fellas. You touch the ground. Really not gonna be able to stand very well. Okay, I'm gonna Is grab you by this harness right here. Okay. And set you in the bottom of the basket. How are your legs feeling? Oh, they feel okay. Okay, sit down though. Okay. Just sit down. Sit down. All the way up. We good? We comfortable? Yeah. Okay, yep, I'm You're comfortable. Pretty fast, okay? Okay. Sing your upper boom in, Wes! The uh, electricity between my carabiners was, I don't know if arcing's the right word, yeah. but it was going through my ribs and it was burning like a son of a bitch. It, I just don't know a whole lot about power and connectivity and being grounded. And I thought since I was in the air, I was... You were, uh, but that shield wire up there? That is grounded. Oh, uh, okay. I'm cool. sure it is on the fine ain't it? Okay. What's that? That shield wire that's probably grounded in your oh, shower. Yeah, yeah so. I'll check y'all out. I'm okay. Yeah, I, I smell burnt skin and some hair. So it might be second degree burns. Yeah. I know it, dude. I thought for sure Bring this, a bit more. this was going to be how I was going to go when I was getting electrocuted and and I desperately got to my satellite emergency transceiver and hit the SOS button yep. and then things started coming together. Oh man, I'm so excited to put my feet on dirt. You ready? Yep. Legs doing okay? Yeah. Right, you here. Right, right, bud. Woo. Thank you. Thank you so much. One more here. Okay, my. Let's let's take a look at the burns first and see see what gotcha. kind of decisions we need to make. How does that sound? That sounds good. Okay. Yeah, so, and it's one of those things. Can we do anything things. to help you? Um, yeah. I'm trying not to point doesn't you. do great things for your heart either. So. Yeah. Well, I thought, boy, I thought for a moment there, cardiac arrest was my primary concern just how fortunate i am to survive this situation does not escape me i mean so many factors you know as many factors lined up for this incident to occur in the first place there were also numerous factors that lined up for my survival 
whoever it was that received that emergency SOS notification at the dispatch center, I'm sure they have some level of discretion and, and space for initiative. Whoever it was took it upon themselves to contact Idaho Power and get this entire set of power lines turned off. I mean, I don't know what town went without electricity for, for about six hours as I hung there, but thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The type of line that my wing was wrapped in that grounded out the electricity. I mean, it was insulated. Had it not been insulated, I think I would have been obliterated into dust. 230,000 volts, we're talking. So even sharing the story to begin with, you know, I've had some reservation about because paragliding, it's not just something I do for fun. It's my livelihood. You know, I'm a tandem pilot. I'm an instructor. But the more I sat on it, the more it kind of ate at me that this needs to be shared. You know, if a pilot of my stature could end up in a situation like this, you are not immune from making a dumb decision. I think it's worth all of us pumping the brakes and asking ourselves, whoa, have I been cutting it close? And Because if you keep cutting it close, eventually it's going to catch up with you. You know, 99 times out of 100, you make it. But it's that one time. You know, back to that learning attitude, I'm trying to think, wow, how can I prevent something like this in the future? And one thing that I do that I've determined that works for me, and I think it's important that we all determine what works best for us, I like to remind myself that my decisions affect others. I have a photograph that I keep in my flight deck, and it has a, a picture. It's a picture of my mom holding my twin brother and I when we were just weeks old. And I stare at that photo. You know, after I do my R1, 2, 3, 4, 5, just look at that image. And so I'm engaging with this, you know, kinesthetically touching it and visually, and then putting it away and then thinking. I don't want to hurt anyone. I don't want anyone to cry. I don't want anyone to go through the misery and suffering that, that comes with, with uh, death. I want to keep flying for, for decades to come.